Good morning, welcome, and thank you all for joining us today for this important and timely discussion on the situation in Yemen. As many of you know, in the last few weeks, we have seen some conflicting developments um, with, uh, on one hand, the United Arab Emirates announcing its withdrawal, while at the same time um, supporting the fighting um, on the other side of its main ally and the coalition. The United Nations also released a report concluding that uh, the United States, Britain, and France um, might be complicit in war crimes in Yemen, while at the same time, there were news of potential talks, um, this time by the Trump administration. It is in this context of um, internal factions, um, multiple and interfering regional agendas, and as well as the international complicity that Yemen remains uh, the world's worst humanitarian crisis today. Uh, we at Arab Center Washington DC sought to organize this panel today to discuss um, the implications of these recent developments and the prospects as well as the policy recommendations for um, a resolution to the conflict in Yemen. Uh, this is part of um, our work, our continued commitment to democracy, human rights, and diplomatic resolution to conflict. I would like to take the opportunity to uh, thank our panelists for being here today and for taking time out of their busy schedules uh, to join us. I would also like to thank um, our director of research, Ahmad Harp, to my right here, who agreed to chair this uh, discussion. But before I give the platform to, to our panelists, please allow me to um, uh, draw your attention to this flyer right here. Um, Arab Center Washington DC's um, fourth annual conference is taking place on October 31st this year and it will focus on the topic of media and democracy in the Arab world, the future of freedoms and rights in the digital era. We hope that you would um, join us and you sign up to attend the conference. And with that, we will return to Yemen and I'll turn it over to my colleague Ahmad. Uh, thanks, Tamara. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Um, uh, well, uh, you know, as we know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to pinpoint a specific date for the start of Yemen's wars, uh, for Yemen's war today. Um, the country has had several of them uh, since its independence of the 1960s. Um, uh, as a result of uh, domestic disputes and uh, um, the clashing interests, elite competition, and outside interference. Um, the current war uh, is, uh, in many respects, an outgrowth of uh, Yemen's version of the Arab Spring in 2011, uh, when hundreds of thousands of youth and activists marched in the streets uh, demanding change from authoritarian rule. Uh, it's not hard to say that their hopes actually were dashed um, when status quo forces subverted the calls for change with a watered-down plan for uh, some sort of a transition um, from the uh, authoritarian rule of uh, uh, Ali Abdullah, the late Ali Abdullah Saleh to his vice president, uh, uh, Abdrabbo Mansour Hadi. Um, the, the, basically, the uh, Gulf Initiative of 2011 uh, basically laid down uh, the principles of a national dialogue conference between different uh, Yemeni factions, uh, trying to really put some sort of a, a plan for the future of the country. Uh, that national dialogue, as we all know, uh, has actually collapsed and uh, because of different competing interests and different competing demands, um, leading basically to the start of uh, internal war in Yemen. Uh, March 2015 um, uh, marked the uh, actual uh, uh, real intervention, uh, regional intervention into uh, Yemeni affairs led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, which formed a coalition for supposedly to restore the authority of uh, President Hadi to Sana'a, uh, to the central state, so to speak. Uh, since then, uh, we're talking about uh, you know, almost, uh, yeah, it is almost four and exactly four and a half years. Uh, not, not, not much has happened regarding returning, restoring legitimate authority to Sana'a, uh, but uh, some military 
uh, victories were achieved in the south uh, against uh, the Houthis uh, who were uh, pushed out of the south and uh, um, and uh, along the coast, the Red Sea coast, uh, in, the, in the west. Um, but not really much uh, has happened other than that on the battlefield, uh, uh, except now we are dealing with a uh, South Yemen that is, uh, with, with forces in South Yemen that are trying uh, to uh, force a, um, a partition of the country into South and North. Uh, not necessarily along the lines of uh, the old South Ye Yemen, North Yemen uh, division, but uh, nonetheless, um, the creation of a southern Yemeni state uh, that would uh, basically mean the partition of Yemen and uh, dismemberment of central authority. Um, uh, we are now looking at uh, really several realities in, uh, on, on the ground in, uh, in Yemen. Uh, we have a Houthi uh, insurgency entrenched in Sana'a and militarily strong uh, because it has been able to, uh, to fight off uh, a, a very, very heavy outside intervention. Uh, we have an, uh, an announced Emirati withdrawal, um, although they say it's partial. Uh, from uh, the south of the country, uh, while uh, at the same time uh, that withdrawal forced the Saudi Arabia to try to send some forces to really make up the difference for uh, in those uh, strategic locations. Uh, third reality is uh, we have the southern secessionist movement that is uh, imposing uh, itself as a de facto, de facto separatist force uh, on, in the south. Uh, despite Saudi fear uh, that this will really affect uh, uh, Saudi uh, stability and uh, security. A fourth reality is an outright Saudi-Emirati clash uh, of interests uh, in Yemen and uh, uh, what happens to the future Yemen? Uh, it just happens that, uh, geographically speaking, the UAE is not directly uh, impacted by what happens in Yemen because it is geographically distant from, uh, from the country. But Saudi Arabia uh, is uh, right there, and anything that happens in Yemen is liable to uh, affect Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, the fifth uh, reality, and there are mo uh, many more, unfortunately, um, uh, it's uh, there is a, a almost like a different kind of strategic look, regional strategic look at what happens in Yemen and who is interfering there and what they uh, feel like uh, they want to do both in Yemen and in the region. So we're, we're talking about uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, uh, and the Arabian Gulf. We're talking about Iran's uh, Iran influence. Uh, we're talking about uh, the UAE being uh, uh, influential in the Horn of Africa, uh, in Somalia and Djibouti and places like that. So uh, uh, these five different realities really uh, uh, make the Yemeni issue a rather complicated issue, uh, both internally and uh, regionally. Um, today, uh, as uh, you know, you have their, uh, their bios in, uh, uh, in your possession. Uh, we have an excellent panel to really talk about uh, these realities and the different agendas that uh, uh, the different uh, uh, factions uh, uh, hold or the different uh, powers that are intervening uh, there. Uh, indeed, their task is uh, unfortunately not easy, uh, given all the complicated aspects of uh, the Yemen war and who is involved in it. Uh, but they will definitely, I'm sure, they will try to inform us as much uh, as possible about a very complicated domestic situation and regional environment. Um, they will be speaking in, uh, I mean, Nabil will be uh, uh, the first to speak, and then Samat will follow him. Nabil will be talking about uh, the domestic internal conditions uh, in Yemen today. Uh, Samat will be talking about uh, also some domestic issues plus the humanitarian situations in the country. Uh, and uh, uh, Christian will be giving us some sort of a uh, uh, overview, so to speak, of uh, the regional situation, whether it's the Gulf or uh, maybe he can involve uh, Iran in it a little bit and uh, um, uh, have a, uh, like a bird's eye view over uh, what's happening over Yemen. 
Um, uh, each will have a 15-minute uh, presentation. Uh, uh, they can uh, go uh, under, but not over. Uh, and uh, I uh, urge you to uh, participate in the Q&A. Uh, ask as many questions as you can. Uh, please use the cards on your chairs. Uh, to write the questions, please write legibly, and uh, a person from the staff will uh, be happy to pick it up, and uh, I will read it. We'll take as many questions as we can, given the time allotment. So uh, uh, thank you very much for being here, and uh, Nabil, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much, uh, the Arab Center, for uh, organizing this panel and for inviting me. Um, some of what, what I will be saying, I think, will be redundant, but uh, just to give you a brief, uh, uh, context of the situation in Yemen, um, how things developed to uh, uh, the situation right now, and where can we see Yemen in the next uh, maybe a year or two. Uh, first of all, I think the catastrophic situation of uh, Yemen now goes back to the uh, uh, events uh, of the Arab Spring, or the so-called Arab Spring, uh, which I think uh, since then Yemenis have not seen any spring uh, in reality. Um, the uh, all, I think many, uh, opposition parties, including including uh, the Houthis, um, which are now important, uh, Al-Islah, which is also another important party in Yemen, took part in uh, those uh, protests against uh, the regime of Saleh, which um, resulted in the um, uh, stepping down of uh, former President Saleh through elections, which is also, I think, important, and this was done uh, according to the GCC initiative, which was brokered by mainly Saudi Arabia, but also by other GCC countries. And let me here just give you an idea about the main parties involved uh, since then uh, and who are now in the uh, political arena in Yemen. So th I think the first uh, party will be the General People's Congress, which is the, the party of the former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. This uh, party was established in 1982. Um, it was the strongest party in Yemen, which ruled Yemen for about th 33 years. Uh, however, after the uh, killing of Saleh by the Houthis uh, in late 2017, I think the uh, GPC uh, was dismantled uh, significantly, and now we see different wings of GPC, whether those GPC aligned in, um, uh, with the Houthis now, who are uh, willingly or unwillingly uh, with the Houthis uh, because they are under their control. And we have also what we call the GPC in Riyadh, who are some of the uh, elements of the GPC party, but uh, they are uh, aligning with Saudi Arabia and uh, had the government um, in Saudi Arabia. But also we have another wing which is uh, based uh, in other places. Um, they're called the GPC of Cairo or the GPC of Oman. So these are um, veterans of the GPC. They were close to Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, but uh, they are against uh, the Houthis because they killed the main leader of the, um, of the party. Uh, and also they are against the uh, Saudi-led intervention in Yemen. And also I, I need to mention that Tariq Saleh, who is the nephew of uh, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh is also fighting um, along with the kind of Hadi government. Uh, I think he's more allied with the UAE uh, and, and now, uh, maybe because one reason uh, is that his cousin Ahmed, the son of Ali Abdullah Saleh and his brother Ammar are based in Dubai, uh, or, sorry, in the UAE in Abu Dhabi. So uh, in that sense, they, um, there's maybe kind of any pressure against uh, Tariq. And um, I think recently, in the last uh, couple of months, Tariq issued a statement uh, in support of uh, the UAE, which is interesting. Um, uh, and because I, as far as I know, Tariq actually is not, is not in support of the secession of the country, but uh, I think there's kind of some kind of pressure on them. So that is the GPC. Now, uh, it was the strongest party in Yemen. Uh, I think not anymore uh, because of the uh, situation right now. I think uh, the, uh, the GPC was centralized uh, by the leader of the uh, party, Ali Abdullah Saleh. After his killing, the GPC has no, uh, I think, uh, strong influence as we speak now in Yemen. The second important party is the Islah Party, which is the Muslim Brotherhood affiliate in Yemen. This party was established uh, uh, immediately after the unification in 1990. Um, they have, uh, and uh, one thing to actually to say about the GPC, they don't have any clear ideology, and this is very interesting. So they, they might have some uh, kind of political uh, maneuverings, but not a, a clear ideology, and uh, not like uh, the Islah or the Houthis, which have some religious ideologies, and uh, it's interesting, uh, interesting uh, or it is like part of their uh, group agenda. Uh, but for Islah, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood ideology, which is, I think, a transnational, uh, uh, it's um, Arab uh, ban movement, uh, 
they uh, would like to have or establish this kind of uh, leadership where they uh, observe uh, Islamic principles according to uh, some sort of uh, Islamic rhetoric. Um, uh, I think, uh, but uh, it's important to say that uh, recently after Saudi Arabia uh, classified the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, uh, Islamic Party it tried to uh, uh, distinguish themselves uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood and they are an independent Yemeni party that has nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. But regardless of these public statements, uh, Islah party uh, is still uh, has this uh, mentality of the Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, and ideology. Uh, and actually even when uh, during the rule of Ali Abdullah Saleh, um, uh, the Islah party was uh, in, in control of the education. And it's interesting how those uh, uh, religious or uh, uh, parties with ideology are very interested in education because of the long consequences uh, on the future of the country. So they are uh, in control of the education. Um, most of the education materials in Yemen uh, has references to, uh, um, I would say, uh, some uh, Muslim Brotherhood rhetoric, uh, especially in what, what used to be called uh, the uh, scientific institutes, which were running by the uh, Islah uh, at the time before they were actually uh, ended in, I think, around 2000. Now, and the Islah party is kind of uh, backing the Saudi intervention uh, in Yemen. Um, they, they claim that they do not have um, the majority in the current uh, Hadi government, but I think they have a big influence on the uh, decision uh, of the uh, Yemeni government in Riyadh. Uh, Ali Mohsen, uh, who's the vice president of Hadi, um, has a long history with the uh, Islah party, and also he was uh, actually classified by uh, some time ago by the uh, some American um, departments as uh, a person of uh, security interest. The other uh, party here is the Southern Transitional Council, and now which this is uh, the most recent one, which. Uh, um, was established in 2017 by Aydarus Az-Zubaydi and uh, Hani bin Barik. And uh, they are, uh, I mean, uh, clearly uh, aligned with the UAE. They are um, just following the orders of the UAE. Uh, they have, of course, uh, some uh, and uh, calls for independence, which has been actually, these are uh, legitimate uh, um, calls for the southern people for a long time, but uh, the STC is different. They are just uh, pushing for the agenda of the UAE. If you go, for example, to Hani bin uh, Twitter account, you'll see uh, MBZ's picture. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, they are, uh, I think, uh, like people like Hani bin Barak and other people are brainwashed uh, by MBZ. And I think this is one of the strate uh, strategies of the MBZ. Uh, see Mohammed Dahlan, see uh, Hani bin Barak, uh, see other people. The MBZ is trying to uh, have people close to him uh, as much as uh, possible and uh, try to impress them with his personality. Uh, interestingly, uh, Hani bin Barak and Aydarus Zubaydi were seen in uh, Emirati Kandura, the Emirati uh, traditional clothes. So uh, I think they, uh, while they, uh, many people in the South, call for independence, they are against the STC. I think that STC does not have any popular support because of the uh, Emirati agenda. And because of that, we have now seen the Southern National uh, Salvation Council, which is now uh, very recently established. And I think the Omanis uh, are pushing for that uh, council because also Omanis uh, see some uh, national security threat uh, as uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE want to control um, uh, governorates uh, close to their uh, borders. And the, the last party here is uh, Ansar Allah, the Houthis, which is uh, the most interesting and the least uh, we know of. Um, the, the Houthis is, as we know, a Zaydi uh, movement. However, they do not actually observe the Zaydi uh, doctrine or the Zaydi uh, ideology. They are more of the extremist uh, part of the Zaydism, uh, what we call Al Hadawiya or Al Jarudiya. So, uh, however, uh, I think this uh, Saudi-led coalition is strengthen the position of the Houthis rather than the, uh, you know, weaken them. And this is a problem now Yemenis need to face. Uh, actually, uh, I would say that the Saudi-led coalition has, has failed to achieve any of its objectives except uh, for one uh, thing that is actually not related to Yemen, which is just securing the, uh, the uh, throne of this kingdom to MBS. Uh, MBS, when the, when the war actually was uh, launched in 2015, MBS was just the minister of, the, of defense. He was 30 or 31 years old. He wanted to claim the latter of, uh, uh, of the throne to be the next king, and I think he is about to be. 
So this is the general political arena. Because of the constraint of time, I would like to say now, as we speak, we are in the uh, time of what I call the musical chairs game. Now everybody is competing for a chair in the negotiations, which I think will happen soon. Uh, I think that, um, unfortunately maybe, or fortunately for some people, the Houthis will have a strong position. They are actually the strongest Yemeni party as we speak now. Uh, the Hadi uh, government does not have, uh, unfortunately, any presence, whether in the north and the south. They are, I think, the weakest uh, element uh, in the equation now. Uh, the, uh, for that reason, the U.S. has started to talk with the Houthis, and actually they did in Oman uh, last month. Uh, it's in in interesting that the Houthis, uh, uh, after the, uh, the meeting with the U.S. Uh, officials, uh, the U.S. officials uh, wanted to uh, have some intelligence cooperation the uh, Houthis were m more interested in having uh, a big uh, comprehensive plan for Yemen. Uh, and the, the Houthis uh, responded to that by uh, merging two of the, actually, uh, just to give a brief context here, there are two main uh, uh, intelligence uh, AI services in Yemen, the National Security Bureau and the Political Security Organization. And the US is more interested in the National Security Bureau because they have worked uh, with the National Security Bureau for a long time on counterterrorism. And the U.S. wanted to have start this cooperation with the with the National Security Bureau and the Houthis to just to stop the Americans from going that direction and to have a comprehensive plan. They merged the uh, two intelligence services uh, under their control, uh, and I think this is important uh, and uh, and is not I think a wise decision by the Houthis anyway. So this is the general political arena. Because of the constraint of time, I would like to say now, as we speak, we are in the a time of what I call the musical chairs game. Now everybody is competing for a chair in the negotiations, which I think will happen soon. Uh, I think that, um, unfortunately maybe, or fortunately for some people, the Houthis will have a strong position. They are actually the strongest Yemeni party as we speak now. Uh, the Hadi uh, government does not have, uh, unfortunately, any presence, whether in the north and the south. They are, I think, the weakest uh, element uh, in the equation now. Uh, the, uh, for that reason, the U.S. has started to talk with the Houthis, and actually they did in Oman uh, last month. Uh, it's in, in, interesting that the Houthis, uh, uh, after the, uh, the meeting with the U.S. Uh, officials, uh, the U.S. officials uh, wanted to uh, have some intelligence cooperation. The uh, Houthis were m more interested in having uh, a big uh, comprehensive plan for Yemen, uh, and the, the Houthis uh, responded to that by uh, merging two of the, actually, uh, just to give a brief context here, there are two main uh, uh, intelligence uh, AI services in Yemen, the National Security Bureau and the Political Security Organization, and the U.S. is more interested in the National Security Bureau because they have worked uh, with the National Security Bureau for a long time on counterterrorism, and the U.S. wanted to have start this cooperation with the, with the National Security Bureau, and the Houthis to just to stop the Americans from going that direction and to have a comprehensive plan. They merged the uh, two intelligence services uh, under their control. Uh, and I think this is important uh, and, uh, and is not, I think, a wise decision by the Houthis anyway. So um, I think that the last point, um, I would say that many uh, friends and some colleagues ask me, so what's going to happen in Yemen? I think the war is coming to an end soon. Uh, I think by next year we will have a resolution. Uh, the international community, the Saudis themselves, uh, I think are convinced at this point there is no military sol uh, solution to this and they, they need to find a solution, a political solution uh, to the Yemen war. Um, I think by next year we will have a new reality, um, but also it will depend on the shape of Yemen. Uh, whether we're talking about one Yemen as we see it now, or a federal Yemen, or a confederal Yemen, or two Yemens. Uh, and I think uh, the international community uh, pl uh, plays an important role, and I think I would leave that to uh, Dr. Ellerson and Sama to talk about the international ramifications of this, but I think the U.S. now does not support the um, separation uh, of Yemen into two. Uh, so this is just uh, a brief, uh, I guess I don't want to go over my time, but I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, thank you for being here. Good morning. Um, so I want to build on what was already said. So thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction that actually sets up perfectly what I'm about to say. I think the complex dynamics of what we see in Yemen today and the divides that we continue to witness are actually the most predictable outcome of the war based on how it was waged, based on the design that we have uh, witnessed in the past. Uh, so in the past 
few days, we've seen divides that some describe as a perceived divide between uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. But those of us who have been following it closely think that this divide has been there from 2016, where on the ground their interests were kind of shifting in different directions. So I just want to remind everyone that in 10 days, it's going to be the 21st of September, and that's going to actually mark the sixth year, the start of the sixth year since the Houthis took over the capital, Sana'a. And I think that is quite an alarming number because ultimately if the goal of the war was to get rid of this group, we have now witnessed them ruling the northern territories of Yemen for six years. Uh, the most important thing that we can talk about is how this war broke down the Yemeni national identity and fractured almost every single massive uh, group or local actor. And I think we can witness that in three main cities. We can see it in Sana'a, where the Houthis and uh, the Saleh, so the original or the primary alliances that the war began with, no longer exist. So in the north, the, the Houthi-Saleh alliance is no longer there. They have eliminated their main partner, Saleh. In the south, what we saw as an alliance between the southern separatist movement and then the southern transitional council and the Yemeni government has, in fact, they have fractured at this point. And then in the city of Taiz, we continue to see a series of fractures between the Yemeni government and its allies. But it's, it's a more convoluted uh, dynamic and on a more micro level than in other parts of Yemen. Of course, there are also the regional tensions that are outside of Yemen that we see, uh, namely the Saudi-Iranian proxy war that's playing out in Yemen. Uh, then there is the, the little micro fractures that are occurring. So you see some tension between Oman and the Arab coalition. I think uh, to be more accurate between Oman and Saudi Arabia separately and Oman and the UAE separately. Uh, I wouldn't even group them together if I'm to be precise. Um, and then of course we see the UAE and Saudi tensions and I, I won't touch too much into that just uh, so that uh, we can kind of have a wholesome conversation towards the end. Uh, but I do, I am very happy to hear that the UAE and Saudi Arabia were able to admit that there was in fact some disagreement on Yemen, uh, and this was a recent announcement, uh, but that it's a smooth, uh, small disagreement that they will iron out. So only days will tell when it comes to that. Uh, so back to the main point, which is what the war did, which is in essence fracture every single structure on Yemen, which I think uh, Mr. Nabil did very well in, in describing. Uh, but I, I, for the sake of what's happening today, I do want to focus on the Yemeni government because the spotlight is on them. I think with everything happening, a lot of people are questioning what is the future role of the Yemeni government, what steps can they do, and can they actually go back to Yemen and unify Yemen altogether? What we witnessed in the past few days is that many ministers and diplomats in the Yemeni government remained silent while other groups in the Yemeni government were more vocal in their attack of the UAE government. So vocal to the point that it was surprising, uh, to the point that we started talking about fracturing the UAE and Saudi uh, coalition based on disagreements uh, with the Yemeni government. President Hadi decided to create a crisis cell that is supposed to deal with the, with the current ongoing crisis. And it's composed of his vice president, his prime minister, and his office director. And in this, I see uh, an alarming fracture also within the Yemeni government, where he is sidelining uh, people from the parliament that recently did an event uh, to show support for the Yemeni president. And so it seems that within the government, there are factions that are situating themselves for possible future scenarios for Yemen. Uh, while the, the issue of unity keeps coming up over and over again, I think in reality and in practicality, I think everyone can kind of get behind it if it is workable. Um, I think when it comes to Hadi's government, that this issue of sidelining has created a lot of difficulties for the Yemeni government. And, and you can notice that specifically with the creation of the Southern Transitional Council. Uh, so two key leaders of the movement, Az Zubaydi and Shalal Ali Shaya, they were key figures, key military figures in helping liberate the south of Yemen uh, and, and enabling the Yemeni government to return to that part of, the, of, of Yemen. Uh, and so what happened is, uh, we can look at it in two different ways, either that the Yemeni government sidelined these particular figures who fought on the ground and really helped the Yemeni government returned to the ground, or another perspective would say that the Yemeni government should not have hired hardline separatists in the Yemeni government 
allowing them to send a message to the separatists that secession is possible. And so it seems that uh, these moves taken and decided by the Yemeni government weren't calculated very well at the start. But what they have done in effect is uh, they sent a confusing message about the possibility of secession, that it might be welcome. And they also, uh, in a sense, if they were rewarding people for uh, fighting with them, kind of sidelined them and didn't give them an important position, say, uh, like other separatist figures that they appointed in government, like the Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and so on. But they, they appointed them on the local level as governors and security directors. So um, I'm going to continue talking about the Southern uh, Transitional Council, not to say that it's more important than other groups or coalitions in Yemen, but again, because of how they are very prominent in the news today. So we see that it's a grassroots movement. Um, it has a lot of flaws. I think the, the, the main flaws that could undermine this movement is that their rhetoric is not very inclusive of all social structures that exist in Aden. So there's very strong uh, kind of discriminatory narratives to some people that may live in the South that would not eventually belong in the South. Uh, the SDC still did not consolidate all Hirak or separatist movement in Yemen because the Hirak movement in Yemen is an, is an umbrella secessionist group that they haven't managed to unify. Uh, they also are a little bit defensive in receiving constructive criticism, which means ultimately that they may not have the answers to all the steps moving forward if secession is a viability. They also lack the financial resources to rebuild government institutions in the south of Yemen. And on that note of government institutions, we have to note that all original government institutions remain in the hands of the Houthi group in the north. And I think that is something that we see in all Yemeni political parties, not just with the Southern Transitional Council, is that none of them have a vision to the future or actual realistic plans to resolve any of the issues in Yemen. How are they going to make Yemen remain one country? How are they going to solve the main disasters of what's happening in Yemen? Um, and I think it all revolves around the economy. And so on the subject of Yemen's disasters, I want to touch briefly on the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. The humanitarian crisis in Yemen is the worst in the world since 2015 and worsening as of 2019. Uh, we actually estimate that 140,000 more deaths are going to occur and that 233,000 deaths have occurred indirectly and directly by the war. Um, so to highlight the humanitarian crisis, I will talk about starvation which is one of the things that are, that are really dominating in Yemen that are rarely talked about by Yemeni politicians or any of the regional actors. So what we see in Yemen is that 15.9 million people of Yemen face severe food insecurity. A lot of them are gonna starve to death if humanitarian aid is cut off. 20 million people in Yemen, that's out of 30, that's more than half the population, is in need of food. They have insufficient food. 17.8 million lack clean water and sanitation. In a recent paper that I did with Dr. Alex Duvall and uh, with the Global Rights Compliance, uh, we looked at drivers of famine in Yemen. What is causing famine in Yemen? And what we discovered is that one is Yemen already has a bad economy. There was already indicators of famine in the future and these economic disasters that Yemen witnessed were always impacted by political disasters. So the more Yemen um, engaged in political conflict, the more these economic, um, economic indicators went down. And so there was that pattern already in place. Second, the country's economic crisis was worsened by the war. Typically what you would see elsewhere, infl inflation is up, uh, depletion of currency is there. But then thirdly, and I think this was the most interesting part of my research, is that we discovered that there were policies implemented during the war, economic policies, that helped exacerbate uh, the situation and make food even more expensive. So in Yemen's case, what's really fascinating is that food is available. However, people lack the, the money to buy it. And food prices have shot up more than 150%. Fourth, we found that there was direct destruction of objects of, is, of indispensable survivor, and that includes uh, bombing of roads, attack on food infrastructure, 
uh, attacks on um, public and private sectors that provide food. And then we saw that every single party in Yemen was involved in some form of taxation that, in, that was higher than it needed to be. And we also saw that there is corruption in the government and a, a thriving smuggling economy that the Houthis uh, managed. Uh, ultimately, in the end, the Yemeni population having to pay the price for that. And so corruption is alarming, Houthi smuggling is high, but I think most importantly what we saw is that the lack of distribution of salaries in Yemen during the conflict helped really contribute to how, and to how people are eating, what they're eating, and whether they depended on outside source uh, for food. And we see this, this method uh, applied by the Yemeni government. First in the north, I think it's a very tricky method because once you stop paying your civil servant salaries, you make their financial responsibility on someone else. In this case, it was the Houthis giving them more legitimacy in the eyes of the northerners receiving money from them. In the past month, we saw that this method was applied on southerners where the salaries of high-ranking military and security officers, they stopped receiving these salaries. And so now we have a pattern that establishes that, in fact, this is a, a method that the Yemeni government um, uses in Yemen uh, as a way for political pressure. So what is being done now? We have Houthi American talks. We have uh, Southern Transitional Council and government talks. We have Southern Transitional Council talking with other separatist Hirak uh, people. We have rumors of Houthis talking with members of Islah and, and other parties. And I think in Yemen's case, the UN envoy, dare I say, has missed his window of opportunity. I think his window of opportunity came when the Hudayda events were taking place, and that's when he really should have stepped in. And so in that case, we see, well, I would call him what Yemenis would say, uh, a burnt card, which means that it's time to play a new card and kind of figure a new way to move forward. What's happening in Yemen now is ideal for a holistic approach for holistic dialogue that involves every branch in, in Yemen to bring everyone back to the table to engage in talks that we witnessed in, in Kuwait or trying to achieve in, in, at the very start of the war. And I think that this is a perfect exit opportunity for Saudi Arabia and the UAE to come out of this conflict where it seems messy, it's tarnished, it's tarnished their name in the media, it's, it's not headed where they want to head. This is a perfect opportunity to step out, but I want to put emphasis on the fact that if peace is going to come, and I've said this before from the very start of the war till today, that peace, if it's going to happen in Yemen, has to be championed by specifically the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And with that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you very much. It's in yours. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the two previous speakers. Um, like you, I think, I was surprised by the launching of the blockade of Qatar in 2017 by Saudi Arabia, UAE, and other countries, partly because I had assumed, I had thought, that the next split within the Gulf states or among the Gulf states would be between Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and it would be over Yemen. Mm -hmm. And I thought that because they had, from the beginning, very different political objectives and also threat perceptions in going into Yemen and in beginning the military intervention in 2015. For the Saudis, there was, of course, for them at least a, a border security issue, particularly once uh, the Houthis and other groups began to uh, fire projectiles into Saudi territory. Of course, as uh, Imad pointed out at the very beginning, the UAE is isolated geographically from Yemen has not a similar border security issue, but instead has a set of political and geopolitical objectives that do, as we've seen, extend across the wider geopolitical region of the Horn of Africa and the southern flank of the Arabian Peninsula. And we all recall a tweet by Mohammed bin Zayed pretty early on in the war that seemed to indicate that for the UAE at least, they felt that it had been mission accomplished militarily once UAE and UAE-backed forces had ejected uh, AQAP fighters from Aden and from Makala. And in their view, this was uh, uh, in perhaps a time to uh, move away from the specific military objectives of the war and start securing geopolitical objectives for the UAE. And uh, that tweet, I think, was quite swiftly deleted as it became clear that uh, 
the, the, the military phase of the campaign would continue, albeit in two very distinctive and different styles, with the Saudis and the Emiratis really focusing on their own areas of responsibility in Yemen and not necessarily coordinating very closely among the two. And uh, there is evidence that whereas Mohammed bin Salman and Mohammed bin Zayed themselves have a close personal relationship and do coordinate at least at the very top uh, aspects of policy making, it's much further down the line of institutional and bureaucracy uh, making, decision making, that's where the coordination begins to fall apart. And we haven't seen very much coordination, on, especially on the ground. So I was surprised, I think along with many others in 2017, that a new fault line had opened up in the in the Gulf, and I suspect that the, the Saudi-Emirati tension could be put off and contained or managed, if you will, uh, as long as it had done, or as long as it could be, partly because as long as the war continued and there was no real prospect of a political settlement, of, of having to think about the future political arrangements of a post-conflict Yemen, they could effectively almost agree to disagree and to put off that day of reckoning when you would have to decide which groups which political parties would be part of any eventual uh, post-conflict uh, resolution. And as, as uh, I think the two speakers have, uh, have made it very clear, that moment is now fast approaching. And so I think it's, it's hardly a surprise that some of these tensions have now, have now come to the surface in the way they have. There have been uh, hints of this over the past two years, uh, hints of uh, clashes between different uh, Saudi and Emirati-backed proxy groups in Yemen, but I think especially now over the past uh, six to eight weeks, uh, the, the sort of the different political end game objectives have, uh, have really become much more apparent and I think will shape the next phase of this, uh, of this conflict if and when it also begins to move towards a political uh, settlement. There were also suggestions that the Emiratis, for example, did not necessarily coordinate with or even consult with the Saudis before they began to redeploy their their forces, and of course the redeployment of troops has been uh, very carefully packaged here in Washington and stage managed to make it look like a, a troop withdrawal when it's just a, a really a, a sort of a phase of moving from one phase of uh, engagement in Yemen to another. Uh, but of course, it's, it, I think it reflects the UAE government's uh, very canny uh, sense of Washington opinion whereby the, uh, the sort of the political heat, the political flack from Congress and from grassroots and advocacy organizations here in the U.S. is now becoming so strong that it, it pays to be seen to be at least looking to try to withdraw your troops or to, to talk about peace in ways that uh, haven't been done in the past. UAE support for the Southern Transitional Movement, of course, does open up new difficult uh, angles for the UA to try to manage in terms of uh, public relations, especially since people now are beginning to uh, draw comparisons between UA support for separatist movements in Libya and also in, in Somaliland, for example, in Somalia. And up until now, uh, one of the advantages for the UAE has been that the focus on the Yemen war criticism in Congress and other political and uh, grassroots outlets has been very much focused on the Saudis. But if now the UAE is beginning to be looked at as a group that is beginning to threaten the political uh, legitimacy of states in a wider region, then that, that could bring a whole set of issues for, for, uh, for, for, for the UAE to begin to have to grapple with in the US and elsewhere. I think there is an increase in US government pressure, undeniably so, for a move towards a political resolution and also increased humanitarian uh, support and relief for Yemen. I think in this most transactional of administrations, with this most transactional of presidents, there's a degree of frustration building up in the White House that the White House has taken a lot of heat, a lot of flack in continuing to support the Saudis and the Emiratis come what may, and has taken a lot of heat from Congress, from members of both parties as well, not from just one or the other party, but hasn't seemed to got very much in return. The war has continued. And uh, the, until now, at least, negotiations for, some, for a settlement haven't, uh, haven't made enormous progress. And I think one aspect that did cause quite a lot of frustration and continues to cause frustration in the White House is the, the lack of follow through on humanitarian relief pledges that were made at the UN pledging conference back in, in February. And it's uh, a matter of quite some frustration, I think, in the White House that of the the $260 million or so that was pledged by the Saudis and the Emiratis, very little of that has actually been dispersed. 
and there's a feeling that if they can't even make good on their pledges, then why should the, at least why should the White House continue to give them a, a sort of protective uh, kind of uh, uh, envelope for, for, for taking the heat off Congress to try to, to bring the war to an end. So I think that was also one of the reasons why, well, one of the reasons that Khalid bin Salman, the brother of MBS, the deputy defense minister, and really the guy who's now been tasked by Mohammed bin Salman to, to sort of try to well, run the war on the Saudi side, because of course Mohammed bin Salman, the initial hopes that as Nabil said he would be seen as a sort of war leader have, have failed rather, rather dramatically. Khalid bin Salman, when he was in Washington two weeks ago, I think he was told in very clear terms that you have to move to a different uh, phase, you have to take seriously the political and the humanitarian support um, for, for a settlement, and you have to begin to follow through. And in this transactional presidency, this matters, and I think the, the White House and President Trump himself, if and when they look at Yemen, they really begin to think of it now as what have we got in return for, for taking so much uh, taking so much pressure on their behalf, why haven't we got anything in return? I think that's going to be something we'll see heavily featuring in the next uh, few few months. Uh, the cost of supporting politically against Congress, the, uh, the sort of continuing coalition members uh, will begin to translate and to feed into demands for much more action on the ground. And so that could just increase, I think, the pressure for, for a settlement. Of course, from other points of view from this White House as well, they want to focus, as has been mentioned by Ahmad, on Iran. This White House especially wants to focus on Iran as the major regional threat, and I think now views uh, Yemen and, of course, the blockade of Qatar and other regional issues as an unnecessary and unwelcome distraction from what, in their view, is the major issue in regional geopolitics. And, of course, for this administration to have put so much emphasis on trying to contain and counter Iran any aspect that draws away from that is heavily unwelcome. So I think that's another aspect of US pressure that we'll begin to see. And then finally, just in terms of laying out a picture, I think we have seen obviously an increase in European pressure as well. And we've seen the movements in several European countries, increasing numbers of European countries to begin to try to use as leverage on the coalition parties uh, the, the uh, threat or the actual withholding of uh, approval for future arms sales. So I think we have seen an increase in international pressure on all the parties to try to begin to move to a, a, new, a new phase. But I do think it's ultimately going to be US pressure that will be instrumental, partly because this is the, the capital that uh, really counts in terms of Saudi and Emirati decision making. They want to make sure that they keep their, their ties with this uh, administration strong. And I think if the, uh, the cost of um, losing or at least eroding support with this administration is, the, is, is a byproduct of continuing to wage that campaign in Yemen that has been going on now for four and a half years, then that will be something that they'll have to begin to reassess and they'll have to begin to draw down their, their insistence on a military solution, which I think as we've all agreed upon is no longer or possibly never was possible. So I also believe that over the next few weeks and months we'll begin to see much more movement towards a political resolution. I think that will open up a whole new uh, can of worms for the coalition parties. I don't know if we can even talk of a coalition anymore on the ground or even politically. I think perhaps the, you know, the, the, so the, you know, this will be the harbinger of a new division within the Gulf. And of course, that could also feed into those other issues in Gulf politics where you have had the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and of course, when we speak about the UAE, we mean Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia really acting in lockstep. We've had that Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed bin Zayed uh, kind of axis really reshaping Gulf politics over the past uh, four years. And I think this is the, the moment of truth, the moment where it will be tested. And we'll see whether the personal relationship can begin to, is, is resilient enough to survive the institutional uh, fissures and the the sort of differing geopolitical objectives for how they see the future of the peninsula, of the political groups that will inevitably have to make up some sort of resolution, whether or not the force of personality, which has been so strong over the past four years and reshaping so much of what we thought we knew about the Gulf politically, whether or not that can survive the next, uh, the next kind of clash in, in Yemen, which of course I think as Nabil may have said, I think on Twitter, you know, he brought the coalition together and now could drive it apart. So with that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I want to remind everybody, uh, uh, please uh, 
right through uh, questions on uh, these cars. Uh, somebody will pick them up from you. Um, I, I want to uh, first take the prerogative of, a, of, a, of the moderator and ask my own questions first uh, of the panelists, and uh, then we go from there. Um, uh, Nabil, uh, first, uh, uh, if you can just simply elaborate on how, uh, for instance, Ahmed Saleh, um, can accommodate uh, the UAE and support the UAE position, but yet at the same time, uh, the UAE is supporting the SDC, the uh, Transitional Council. How does he accommodate these two? How, do, how does he put these two together? Uh, or can he put these two together? Um, uh, Sama, if you can, uh, you know, you mentioned something about uh, uh, the government and the uh, fissures within the government, fracture, fractures within the government, but uh, Yemeni government is a government in Riyadh. I mean, how free is it and how quick can it really think for itself? Uh, how freely can it really think for itself to put whatever policies that are required for a uh, for a uh, for getting out of the crisis of Yemen? Uh, for um, a Christian, if you if you could just simply, I, I, I want to push you on this. Uh, uh, I know what the answer is going to be, um, because I don't have one. Uh, uh, it's impossible to answer, but what is it? What will crack the White House's position on supporting UAE and Saudi Arabia and Yemen? Uh, we know that the administration is really under a lot of pressure. The Congress is uh, against it and all that. But what is it that's going to crack this front here? Nabil? Thank you. So uh, I think Ahmed is in a very difficult situation. Uh, Ahmed, uh, let's say before um, uh, this war started, um, in some way or another, was kind of respected uh, son of uh, Saleh. Um, uh, he, he has um, been the, uh, the uh, head of the presidential uh, or the Republican Guards in Yemen. But after the, uh, the war, he, uh, he was kind of uh, silent. He was sent to uh, the UAE. Actually, he was appointed the ambassador of Yemen to the UAE by President Hadi. And uh, let's remember that the, uh, the most strategic achievement of Ali Abdullah Saleh was the unification. Uh, and Ahmed realizes that. So uh, I'm sure that Ahmed uh, and his uh, cousins are against uh, the secessionist movement in, in Yemen. Uh, but as you said, he is in, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi, as Hadi is in Saudi Arabia. So they don't, they, are, they, don't have the, they don't enjoy the freedom to say what they want. Ahmed was seen as sometime as uh, the next uh, president of Yemen. I think he has no future in Yemen, uh, to be honest. And I think he is not interested anymore in ruling Yemen. Uh, but uh, in some way or another, um, the UAE wants to use him uh, for any future maybe uh, uh, settlement. Uh, but I think um, Ahmed now uh, will, uh, I think, be very hesitant to, to go back to Yemen or even take any position in Yemen. Uh, with any future government. And then we need to remember that he's actually under sanctions by the United Nations. And uh, he is uh, kept in, in, in the UAE and uh, he's kind of appreciating the, uh, the favor. Um, and uh, Tariq, of course, is uh, fighting um, in behalf of the Saleh family in Yemen. He's leading the, fo uh, the forces in the West Coast. And um, uh, they have to uh, kind of ally with the UAE uh, uh, in, in some way or another. But eventually, I think Ahmed uh, will not be able to do uh, anything with the future settlement, um, and uh, he will be out of the equation. And uh, anyway, whatever he, what, whatever he thinks about the secessionist movement will not uh, help any party anyway. Okay. So on um, the Yemeni government, I think it's really important to note that since 2012, since actually 2012, 2013 onwards, uh, when the decision was made to have President Hadi as the leader of Yemen, uh, a lot of Yemenis understood that that was a transitional period and that President Hadi was not going to be that reformer leader of the country. Uh, and it's mostly because he was the vice president of President Saleh. Um, he was also a, a southerner who couldn't represent the southern separatist movement because he joined forces with Saleh. So he had a lot of uh, problems to begin with just as a, as a, as an, uh, as a leader. Uh, but then also his leadership style was the same before the war. It's not like the war occurred, then he was in Saudi Arabia and things deteriorated. His government was, was facing a lot of problems in Yemen even before the, the, the Houthi coup happened and before uh, he went to Saudi Arabia. 
Um, and so what we saw specifically after the war happened is that there was uh, a wave of really disappointing uh, appointments that the president made. Uh, that included uh, appointing some figures that at times uh, saw Yemen as a divided country. Uh, some of the policies were discriminatory. The citizens of Yemen were not viewed as equal based on geographic location. At times, they exacerbated sectarian narratives um, to, to their advantage, of course, to them remaining in power and to them remaining in Riyadh. And I think ultimately now, fast forward to 2019, the issue is no longer with uh, President Hadi as a president. I think whether he's president or not president has proven to be indifferent for the country. I think the issue comes down to who's underneath that president and who is gonna carry out the tasks of, of uh, functioning in government. And I think that um, certainly the appointments have improved. Uh, the new people that we see in the Yemeni government are far better than the people that he first appointed right after the war. But it begs the question of, is it too little too late? Um, and I think with the Yemeni government losing ground, it looks and acts as weaker. Um, and so I think if the Southern Transitional Council, under the, the, the talks in Saudi Arabia with the Yemeni government, if they are able to strike a deal in which the Yemeni government returns, then we can see hope in that, in where the Yemeni government is now is going to come back, and then we come back to the main suggestion that we put on the table at the very start of the war, which is the creation of presidential councils. So instead of one person leading Yemen, we would have a council of several figures that represent several regions of Yemen, several political parties. And I think effectively to keep uh, Yemen whole means that you have to provide the population alternatives from the militias that are ruling on the ground. If Yemen doesn't want a southern separatist movement or a Houthi movement or uh, whatever movement is born in Yemen that could threaten the unity of Yemen, the Yemeni government has to provide the Yemeni population's alternative and has to provide them uh, with an ability to have a dignified life. So if the Yemeni government is able to do that, then we can definitely, I think the entire population of Yemen would put its weight behind it. Because ultimately, the Yemeni people don't really want to be led by ideological groups. Um, so they have that opportunity. Thank you. And just like a very short yeah. comment on this. Um, actually, um, as uh, Sama said, it's, uh, the, uh, the current uh, Hadi Yemeni government is um, uh, transitional. And um, I think it's important to understand that any peace deal will result in the end of Hadi, of course, and his government. Uh, so um, if you want to be realistic, the Hadi government will not be, it will not have any role in the future of Yemen. Actually, they don't have, I, I, for me, I don't think that they have any uh, role in the current uh, Yemen. They are, uh, they have no, uh, no popular support, unfortunate. Unfortunately, the, uh, as Sama said, we have militias in the north and in the south, and I'm just trying to be realistic here uh, as we see the uh, situation in the country. The, uh, the Hadi government lacks any, any, uh, any efficient you know, uh, stands in Yemen, and uh, which actually makes it the weakest uh, in the current time. And I think that if we want to think about Yemen in the, uh, in the near future, Hadi government will not be there. And uh, this is a problem. Now, what is the new government? What is the shape of the new government is uh, difficult to see at this point. And I agree with you, As those who will be under Hadi will have maybe a share in the, uh, in the government. And I think, the, um, the, the, those who are actually oppose uh, the Houthis um, should now blame the Saudi Arabia for actually strengthening the position of the Houthis in the north. And I think, uh, as I see from a realist, just a realistic uh, view, the Houthis, unfortunately, will be part of any government in the future, and Hadi will not be there. But maybe some of his people under him. And uh, it also depends on how the international community will handle this kind of settlement where the Houthis will be there, where the southerners cannot, will not accept the, any uh, Houthi run Yemen, of course. Uh, the, the, uh, the people in the north, I think, now have a uh, little of option to uh, go against or you know, oppose the, uh, the Houthis. Thank you. Uh, what will crack the White House position, you know, it's sort of asking you to get in the mind of President Trump, which is not always easy. Uh, you think of the tweet about Syria, which uh, upended all sorts of uh, uh, settled positions and led to resignations, and of course we could see something about anything at any time, and uh, flippant answer will be Fox News. He could see a report about Yemen war on Fox News and change his mind, but the, 
The non-flippant answer is that I think right now the White House is trying to leverage the Saudis and the Emiratis to say, You've, you need to follow through on your pledges because we've had your back and we need something in return. I think if and when that policy of trying to get something in return is seen to have not produced or sufficiently produced that return, then that will change. At what point that will be, I don't think anyone other than the president probably knows. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I have a, quite a group of uh, questions here. Um, first from uh, Mohammed Shinawi from uh, VOA. This is for, the, for, for everyone. Um, uh, what are the major requirements needed to end the war in Yemen, and who would be the major domestic, regional, international players involved? So uh, if you can answer in about a minute only. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Nabil, you can start. Okay, so I, I think um, the main uh, key to the uh, end of the war is uh, re coming uh, to the table. And I think this is uh, happening soon. Uh, even if many uh, of the uh, uh, parties involved in the war are not in a good position, but the international community is uh, pressure to end the war is, I think, significant. And I th everybody knows that everyone is a loser in this war. There are no winners in this war. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, the, this is the reality of international relations, or this is the, re the reality of, of uh, how uh, politics and military works. If you have a foot in the ground, then you have a chair and the table. Uh, and let's, uh, as I said, if we look at the um, political and uh, geography of Yemen, uh, we have now uh, the STC and had the government in the south. We have uh, Ma'rib uh, governorate, which is actually run by, uh, uh, which is kind of a semi-state within uh, Yemen, which is actually maybe the best uh, option um, or the best, uh, uh, has the best situation in Yemen, which is, I think, supported by uh, now by some international community, but also has uh, some uh, Muslim Brotherhood affiliation. Uh, Sultan al Rada, I would say, is uh, closer to the Islah party. And also we have the Houthis in the north, and I think these are the important parties will be in the, uh, in the table uh, uh, when we talk about the Yemen. Uh, however, we need to uh, look into the regional ramifications of this. Uh, as uh, I think uh, Sama and uh, Dr. Yelrickson said, uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, on the borders of Yemen. So they uh, have a decisive role on uh, the future of Yemen. And uh, if Saudi Arabia decides to stop the war and encourage political uh, solution, we will uh, uh, have this war come to an end. Uh, and I think this is now the conviction about uh, f from anyone uh, in the war, and uh, as especially after the uh, withdrawal of the UAE, Saudi Arabia uh, knows for sure that there is no way you can end this war uh, or can win it uh, against the Houthis. Uh, they did not reinstate the, the government or the legitimate government, as they say. However, they're tearing up the country. Now they're creating more problems than solving uh, problems in Yemen. Uh, so what we need is international community pressure to end the war, uh, regional uh, also support, uh, and especially from Saudi Arabia, uh, to end the war and encourage political settlement. We will have uh, now a new, uh, I mean, I, I, my ideal uh, uh, scenario, if we can have a, a one year of a transitional government, and we have a problem with the transitional governments. Everyone wants to stay for a long time. I, the shorter is a, tran a transitional period, the better. And then we have a general elections. Let's re remember that Yemen is a democracy. I mean, I'm not saying that we have free elections, but we have elections. We uh, president is elected, the parliament is elected. Uh, so um, the problem, though, when we have elections, those who are in power will be maybe manipulating the results of the elections. But at least we have elections. So uh, let's uh, have these uh, parties resolve their differences for now, and let's uh, hold elections. And whoever wins uh, will govern Yemen for four years, six years, and then we have another cycle of elections. Uh, but we need international support. Yemen is a very, the poorest country in the Middle East. Without international support, without international community, and here I'm not saying uh, usually or only the original power, but mainly the United States. The United States it has, if uh, real, it, it really wants to end the war, they have to pressure all the parties, and I think they are able to pressure all the parties, including regional powers and also domestic players. Thank you. I mean, I, I would reiterate a lot of that, um, but I think ultimately what needs 
to happen is that for every side of the conflict needs to genuinely come with a will to end the war, and that's what we haven't seen. We've seen people going to negotiation tables but not actually wanting peace or actually believing that it's time to exit. Uh, so this perhaps could be it, perhaps not. Uh, however, we do know that from this point on, Yemen is going to be a series of crisis management. Um, it's going to be uh, difficult to have Yemen be what it was before. This war has, in essence, undone uh, the past 20 years of development that Yemen may have witnessed. And I do want to second the idea that Yemeni people should have the right to elect and go to the voting poll uh, merely for the dignity of the Yemeni people who have been told who's going to lead them and what's going to happen by not only uh, invading powers on the ground, but by also regional powers that totally dismiss the will of the average individual in Yemen. Uh, and so I think that's the most important thing. Thank you. Oh, just, I mean, I would just add that, I mean, there's no, I mean, to just end the war, I mean, we have multiple wars going on at the same time. You have multiple battlefronts, and so there will not be a one-size-fits-all ceasefire or any sort of model towards moving from one phase to another. And so whatever moves are made will have to be flexible enough to accommodate all the different actors and parties. And again, all the different sets of negotiations that may have to take place. Thank you. Um, the, this question is for Sana. I'm, I'm, I'm personally um, uh, interested in this question. Uh, uh, from Hanin uh, Khirfan from Inside Arabia. In 2006, Yemen uh, was ranked last in the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Index. And in 17, the country was listed the worst place in the world to be a woman. Women have been hit the hardest by this conflict. Where do you see Yemeni women after war and reconstruction? Do you think that women's situation will be better than it was before due to changes in Yemeni society or worse, will, uh, or women will have to, uh, short, uh, to start from scratch? So um, thank you for that question. I do think that women tend to suffer the most in, in Yemen and especially in the conflict, but I can't say that based on the statistics that we've been seeing that the men are doing that much better. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Yemen's case, we see that children tend to pay the most price. We see the same problems of um, children fatalities, um, children being underweight. Uh, all of these problems can be resolved by better access to health care. Um, and better access to funds. One of the things that this war has created is um, a blockade of some sort to the northern portions of Yemen, although the south of Yemen also suffers from very similar uh, issues, which is they don't have an ability to access medicine or health care. Um, and these things are easily fixed if there's a plan in place to make medicine available and to make it affordable and to uh, guarantee that these people have access to health care. When it comes to education, I think that's where we're going to struggle the most. Uh, I think Yemeni women tend to drop out of schools, not finish their education, and are usually married very young. But I think those are also tied to economic opportunities. I think if the Yemeni people have an opportunity to live and have access to income, then uh, Yemeni families, which are typically very large in size, averaging at seven uh, children per family, wouldn't have to marry their children very young because they can't feed them. And so it seems like everything in Yemen is linked to how poor the country is. Um, and I think that once you start fixing the underlying causes of that, then we can hope that Yemeni women uh, can have a better life. Politically speaking, uh, we see a Yemeni government with very little female representation in there. There are a few women in there, however. And I think that at the negotiate, negotiation tables, we haven't seen uh, a lot of women organically selected there, but we saw a UN process that's trying to push and include women in the, in the negotiation process. To be honest, just because the war is led by a lot of men on the ground, it wouldn't be such a bad idea to have the men agree that we need peace in Yemen and then involve women in the peace building process moving forward. Thank you. Um, this question is from uh, Mohammed Awais. Um, uh, uh, does the tribe still have power in Yemen, especially uh, Hashid and uh, Bakil? Um, this is for, uh, for Nabil and uh, Sama. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, a, a tr a tribes are, um, have a, a strong role in Yemen for a long time, and Yemen is a tribal society. And actually, it's the origin of Arabs, so all, almost all the tribes around the Arab world are uh, originating from Yemen. 
And let's say that uh, the uh, period of Saleh, uh, who was the most controversial, I think, figure in Yemen, whether we agree with him or not agree with him, he was not that very oppressive. And this is important to understand uh, the rule of tribes before uh, the war and now. Saleh gave some air and uh, some also as influence for tribes in Yemen. And that's why his actually strategy in Yemen is to playing on different uh, factors uh, in controlling Yemen. So uh, under Saleh, tribes have, have had actually an, an, a very important role in the, in the country, and they still do. However, after the war, and especially I think killing Saleh is very important here because Saleh is seen as the most uh, or the strongest uh, person in Yemen. Killing Saleh in that way by the Houthis and without the tribes going back for him, who was actually from Sana'a, and he was killed in Sana'a, this actually uh, weakened the role of tribes in Yemen. The, the tribes in Yemen used to be a, a challenger to the state uh, sometimes. Now I think, the, especially in the north here, I think that tribes are kind of scared of from the oppressive and, uh, and the iron fist of the Houthis in the north. So they are crushing, the Houthis are crushing everyone who are not with them. And if the Houthis were able to kill the strongest man in Yemen, I think, and also humiliating people like Sadiq al-Ahmar, who was very important and very influential in Yemen, and you know, bombing uh, their houses in the north, Sadiq al-Ahmar, Hamid al-Ahmar, and uh, many others from al-Ahmar family, then the tribes now, I think, uh, are not as strong as they were. I think that I see the tribes role is weakening. Now, actually, personally, I'm actually with less role of the tribes because actually this is a challenge to the state. However, the way it's working now is the Houthis having a very oppressive uh, strike against the, the, the tribes where whether you ally with us or we will, you know, uh, end this tribe. And this is what's happening, especially in the, in the north of the country. In the south, we still have some tribes. Uh, but I think also their role is uh, dependent on the uh, regional and international support because of the, uh, uh, of course, uh, by the end of the day, uh, the uh, Yemeni tribes can fight uh, the Yemeni government, but it's difficult for Yemeni tribes to, uh, find, uh, to fight uh, regional powers with airstrikes, with uh, state capabilities. So they need to be uh, adopted under regional power, like whether to be with uh, Saudi Arabia or with UAE or with Oman. But I think, generally speaking, I, we see the Yemeni tribes weakening, uh, but still they have uh, some role. Um, actually, also, the, as the tribes have you know, some negative uh, influence in the country, they have some positive uh, um, influence in resolving some uh, issues, mediating between different tribes. Uh, but um, anyway, the, the role is weakening uh, from what I see. it. I don't know if someone has a different point of view here. Um, for the Yemeni tribes, I think that there was a point where they were weakened, but I think that they have made a comeback as something else, not as the traditional tribe structure that we've seen in the past. Uh, I, I think it's important to emphasize that a lot of Yemen, not just the north, is, is tribal, and I think that even in the south, we see this return to tribalism uh, that could either be beneficial for social cohesion or could be signaling a future uh, his, you know, uh, conflicts in the South based on historical uh, conflicts that existed between sultanates or emirates there. Uh, in the north of Yemen, I think that the Houthis leveraged political, the, the tribal structure very well to their advantage. I think the Saleh death is actually a perfect <coughs> example of how they can talk and negotiate with tribes as not to have them come back for vendetta. And so I, I think more than, you know, a lot of times when we look at the Houthi group, we think of it as a, 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 a kind of a, a new group that emerged with this new ideology that's leaning to 12 or Shia. Uh, I think it's actually more that they leveraged their, their ability to work with tribes. <laughs> um, and so because of that, they, they are as strong as they are today. And I think it's because the tribes have not engaged in conflict with them that they remain in place. Uh, but I also want to say that the tribes of Yemen have been paid by outside uh, forces because of how powerful they are. And so we know that, for example, um, uh, the UK started by paying off tribes in, in the south of Yemen to weaken them and to have influence on them. And then Saudi Arabia later on adopted the same system with tribes in the north, where they continue to receive monthly salaries. Um, and so the power of the tribes cannot be underestimated. 
Uh, thank you. This, uh, this, um, uh, a couple of questions to, uh, for, um, uh, for Christian. Uh, this is from Ahmed Al-Futihi, I believe, uh, from the Yemen Embassy. Uh, knowing that Iran and Hezbollah are supporting Houthis uh, with military training, uh, with military uh, for, uh, forces and training, etc., how would the uh, Yemen's future be if Iran stopped supporting the Houthis? The second question is, uh, if I may combine it with it, uh, um, uh, from William Embry from DAI Inc. What's the future for the Saudi UAE coalition? All the easy questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. In 30 uh, seconds, please. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I mean, Iran has been supporting elements of the Houthis, and that has been to some extent a another, and then, well, I, I guess wholly anticipated a consequence of the decision to go into Yemen in the first place in 2015 with the military intervention. It's kind of created that consequence. It was designed to forestall in much greater ways. Um, obviously, if that support stopped, then there would be a weakening to some extent of the, I guess, the anti-status quo elements on the, on the ground, uh, whether or not it would be weakened enough to uh, really change the balance of power. I have my doubts. I don't think Iran is necessarily playing the... Uh, the sort of such a, a major role is to tip that balance of power in, in, in one side's favor or the other. And then just the future of the Saudi-UAE coalition, I, I don't know if there is still a coalition to really speak of. I mean, I think, as we, as we all made the point in, 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 in the presentations, it's very much been that they've been doing their different things in the last four years, going different ways in any case. And I think that's just become much more out in the open now. It's not necessarily concealed by a fig leaf of working in a coalition and just having that sort of structure of a coalition while really acting separately in kind of different spheres in, in different places. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to combine some questions because we're running out of time. Uh, this is from Hannah, uh, Hannah Porter. Uh, she's an independent analyst. Uh, this is for Nabil and Sama. Uh, what is the nature of talks between the SDC and the Hadi government today? Uh, the government initially said that it would negotiate, uh, it would not negotiate until uh, SDC withdrew from uh, and gave up arms. Uh, has the government changed its position? Um, uh, there is a question in Arabic here. I'm trying to quickly, um, uh, also for you too, um, to quickly translate. Uh, it's unsigned. Um, basically, the idea is um, the, the enormous military power that Hezbollah Islah the Islah party had in Ma'rib uh, did not fight the Houthis. Uh, now they are uh, using those to uh, fight the, uh, the South. Uh, could you comment on that? Okay, so for the, um, for the first question uh, about the SDC uh, had the government talks, um, I think uh, there are no productive talks uh, so far. Um, uh, I welcome actually had the uh, government's uh, position uh, on not uh, holding talks with the SDC now before they fully withdraw from the positions that they uh, uh, controlled um, a few months ago, or a couple of months ago. Uh, I think now it's a very important uh, time uh, for Hadi or STC. This is time to find the chair on the table. You need to win. If you don't win, you're not going to be in the future. I think uh, STC should um, uh, and, I mean, uh, withdraw from those uh, locations and also like uh, accept uh, Hadi as uh, the uh, the um, president uh, of the Yemeni government. Uh, otherwise, the Yemen, uh, the Hadi government will not be in um, in a good position. Let's remember that uh, Hadi or none or, or his government are not uh, based in, in, in Yemen, uh, but SDC uh, are actually. Uh, so uh, they need now to have the pressure on uh, on the SDC, and they should benefit from the Saudi stance against STC as, you know, as I think uh, Dr. Yorkson explained, the difference between Saudi Arabia and UAE about the rule of the STC in Yemen. Uh, and should, uh, I think, uh, keep this position until they uh, pressure the STC to uh, go to the uh, talks and be part of uh, a deal where they recognize Hadi as the uh, president. Because in this case, any STC uh, representation in the future uh, 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 negotiations, which I, I'm like, I'm positive is going to be next year, uh, you will have a, a say. Now, if Hadi government sells out this uh, time and they don't benefit from having a strong position on the STC, they will really have a very weak uh, uh, role of any uh, negotiations in the near future. Okay. 
I just uh, want to point out that in 2013 and 14, when the Yemen National Dialogue was taking place, the Houthi militia was brought into the National Dialogue as the representative of the Sadda cause, which I think is a mistake because they gave them such a powerful seat, uh, which actually helped lead to where we are today. I think in dealing with the Southern Transitional Council, it's important to not make them the sole spokespeople for the separatist cause because there are also other vehicles there that, that carry the same grievance but don't necessarily agree to their vision. Um, and so I think how the government chooses to deal with the STC, whether they're the sole vehicle carrying the secessionist uh, cause or whether to also include other factions in that would be detrimental to the future of Yemen. On the position of the government, whether it changed or not, um, I really think that you should ask the Yemeni government what their official position is. Uh, as for what's happening in, in, in about Islah and in Madhab in the South, I think in the South we see uh, a lot of presence to some Salafi forces, and we also see presence of uh, Islah in the Yemeni government. And so naturally they would have a say and interest in what's happening in the South of Yemen. But Islah, as we know it, has also fractured, just like GPC and other factions, where we see um, the three components that composed Islah, which were the tribes, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Salafis, have fractured and have been fracturing since 2011, when the Salafis decided to break off and create their own political parties, and now with the Muslim Brotherhood of Yemen kind of having this unique fracture that we haven't seen elsewhere, where we have uh, a side that broke off and uh, changed their position on the war when Qatar uh, was kind of pushed aside, and we see some other factions of the Muslim Brotherhood that don't have an issue with that and would continue to be part of the, um, the Arab coalition. So I don't find it surprising at all that uh, some, some elements uh, from Madhab went to engage in the fight in the South. Um, I have, um, I have um, uh, quite a few questions still left, but I would like to, uh, just um, for the panel, anybody who can comment on this, uh, uh, how can uh, ISIS or um, uh, Al-Qaeda in uh, Arabian Peninsula exploit the fissures, the fractures that are happening uh, in the areas where they are operating? Um, uh, and uh, I mean, you know, there is, uh, in, uh, whether it's Mukalla or uh, Aden or any place like that, uh, how can they exploit these fractures? Uh, another question is uh, on, um, uh, are there prospects for local peace agreements in Ta'iz specifically, as well as in other areas? This is for uh, Sama. So I can't believe we made it this far, uh, and only now we're talking about Al Qaeda and, <laughs> and ISIS. It's usually the first thing that we talk about uh, in the U.S. when it comes to Yemen. Uh, Yemen has been a theater for U.S.'s war on terrorism, and there is no doubt that in this war, um, Al Qaeda and ISIS may not be mentioned as much, but they are still operating there. And I don't think that the U.S. had uh, shifted its perspective on Yemen when it comes to that. Um, and also the Arab coalition has made uh, a very strong statement at the very start of the war that they will fight uh, what they consider terrorism in Yemen. Um, and so when it comes to that, we can say that they are still there. There's that potential risk of them popping. They're just operating under uh, the radar for the moment. Um, and when it comes to Taiz, unfortunately, the situation there does not seem like it will get any better. Taiz continues to be sidelined. Um, the problem with Taiz is that it's within a territory that is largely controlled by the Houthis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so typically, whatever the Arab coalition is implementing on Houthi-controlled territory, the Houthis are then applying on Taiz as a double punishment sort of thing. Um, and so I think it's going to take a while to solve the Taiz issue and would definitely need its own acknowledgement, which then highlights how fractured Yemen has become and how many uh, councils or, or um, reconciliation efforts we're going to have to achieve throughout the country. Um, I'm sorry, we time's up, but uh, I'm going to give you uh, each a minute to wrap up on, on your particular uh, you know, uh, participation contribution. Christian, you can start. Okay. Well, just following on the previous question, I mean, from a U.S. government point of view, there's also additional concern, as Samar said, about U.S. objectives, which are, of course, heavily influenced by counter-terrorist uh, policy over the last 15, 20 years. And there was heavy U.S. pressure on the UAE, for example, in 2016, 17, to really do much more to focus on on the threat from AQAP and from ISIS in southern, in southern Yemen, there was a feeling that the 
there was a you know, potential that this could create alarming gaps where the, these groups could begin to once again take root. And uh, if you remember, one of the very first acts of the Trump administration within days of it coming to office was to undertake a joint raid with the UAE in southern Yemen, which uh, um, well, led to the death of one US Special Forces uh, soldier. I mean, I think it was no coincidence that that was literally one of the very first things the Trump administration did. So I think from a US perspective, that's also very much on their minds. So I, I will just add as an analyst that the um, even after the end of the war, uh, I think Yemen has a, a very long way to go. And uh, I will echo what uh, Sama said, that we will have a time of a crisis management for a long time, especially after you know we uh, have more polarized political and uh, popular components in Yemen. So uh, we will need like a long time to uh, have Yemen even go back to uh, what was it um, before this war. Uh, but um, as a Yemeni, I would say that um, I hope the Yemeni people uh, and uh, elites will be able to resolve their tensions uh, by themselves uh, and embody this uh, claimed wisdom. Uh, I think Yemenis uh, have the potential to uh, resolve any differences without uh, international intervention. And I hope that, and I, I think as Yemenis, we should not, uh, I, we should refrain actually from uh, celebrating, uh, entertaining, or encouraging uh, killing of Yemenis by uh, foreign actors, regardless of those uh, Yemenis, whether they are in the political orientation, whether they are in the north, whether they are in the south, or anywhere in the country. And, we, and regardless of the foreign actor who is uh, killing Yemenis, I think these uh, have long consequences uh, in Yemen, and the uh, Yemenis should uh, be aware about that. Thank you. Um, I'll just remind that we have this window of opportunity for Yemen today to actually shift the conversation and engage all the significant actors in the conversations that need to be had. Uh, and I think we need to keep our eyes on how these negotiations and talks will take place. Because if they're mismanaged, we can safely say that there could potentially be more years of conflict. Uh, and Yemen's war could end up playing out like Lebanon's civil war 15 years plus. Uh, if those opportuni opportunities continue to be missed. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists for a very, very informative panel, and uh, thank you all for being here with us, and uh, please uh, 